one plant here, one plant there. Um, anybody ever grown an eggplant or a pepper plant that was four or five feet tall? Anybody here? Some people have. Yeah. Most people don't think that's possible. They wouldn't consider giving an eggplant two and a half feet. Questions? Yes. Um, going way back to when you were talking about dry vetch um, clover combinations, um, as far as the concept of like killing the rye and clover still coming up, you, have you noticed problems with vetch? Still? Vetch will also come up. Vetch, vetch will, will not die. It'll, it'll keep growing. Okay. Yeah. So if you use something like tomatoes, have you seen a problem with it binding on the tomatoes? Um, if you came to my farm, you would notice a lot of what appear to be dead weeds that are pretty big. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I, I consider myself to be pretty much of a half-assed operator. Um, I'm pretty. Um, um, if something is is you know competing with a crop, I'll come through and pull it out, or or just you know pull the top off of it. Um, but it's really pretty easy. Um, what I generally do with most of my transplanting crops is that I mulch them heavily after transplanting. So whatever clover or vetch or anything else that's left under there is under a pretty heavy dose of mulch. And so it, um, if it does make it through, it's not usually a competition threat. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Um, for large acreage kind of management, that would not be pragmatic possibly. Um, and you could certainly do it just straight into the ride. Um, but yeah. Uh, cert certainly vetch does climb stuff and vetch will, you know, suffocate mm -hmm. some plants, so you need to keep an eye on it. Eye on it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. How about not questions or comments? Any interjection from the audience or something to keep going? Yes. How do you keep uh, applying mulch and maybe taking it off if you're growing salad greens? Like I find that it, it gets really time consuming. Just like managing lots of hay mulch? Um, um, my experience with mulch is that uh, it usually disappears in a couple of months. Um, that my soil seems to eat it. Um, in some cases I have to reapply in the middle of the summer because I'm getting down to bare soil. Right. Um, I generally try to begin under sowing um, cover crops onto that mulch you know, layer of duff um, by the middle of August or so. Um, I, they didn't say this in the cover crop section. I should have said this in the cover crop section. Um, I see no reason to wait until the tomatoes have died or have been killed by the frost before I plant my cover crops. I see every reason to plant my cover crops a good month or month and a half before my tomatoes are going to die. Um, I would like my cover crops to be a foot or a foot and a half tall when the tomatoes die. Um, so I don't see any reason why you can't put your cover crops into your kale and your chard and your collards and your you know, summer squash and your winter squash and your tomatoes and your eggplants. I mean, there's a lot of plants that I think you can put, you can under sow cover crops into long before those plants are going to be out of the field. Um, and then you can, you can again have that, that you know, seamless transition from one, one set of plants to the next without any tillage, without any soil disturbance, um, it's just a sort of a gradual succession. Um, so that's what I try to do. I generally look for a rainy couple of days, um, like I know it's going to be a couple of days of clouds and thunderstorms or maybe a tropical storm or a hurricane or something, residue of a hurricane coming through and you know start looking around the middle of August, maybe up here you can start even at the beginning of August um, and get ready for that and then go out and just broadcast the cover crop mix right underneath those plants that are growing in the, in the field at that point. Um, and you're able to do that because you've obviously you've mulched your tomatoes and then at that point in the season the mulch layer By that is time like it's down much. to a layer of duff which is pretty small. Um, and you just broadcast, I just broadcast right them right on there? Onto the mulch. If you know it's going to be rainy for a couple days then the mulch actually is going to hold the moisture and they're going to you know, work their way in there and that will help serve to, as like a nurse you know, to help help them germinate. Right. Um, you certainly can soak your cover crop seeds because sometimes the issue is if you don't have enough soil cover that they don't get wet enough and they and they don't germinate and then the you know birds come and eat them all and then you just you know have expensive bird feed. Um, so so um, soaking the cover crop seeds for 12 hours just in a bucket of water. Basically, you take your your cover crops, 
you know, fill up a five gallon bucket halfway full, fill the bucket full of water. Um, you know, night before you're gonna go plant them. You know, you, you can watch the weather, see the rains come coming, get the seeds nice and soaked, get them all, get them all expanded and ready to pop, and then broadcast them down right before the rains. Um, nothing complicated about it, totally simple. You just have to be a little bit proactive in your in your in your in your practice. Um, yeah, I don't. It helps when I don't have a um, uh, a cropping plan for where I plant my salad beans. Um, so certainly, if there's areas where there is a lot of mulch, I'm not going to be putting in salad beans there. I don't. If there's mulch on the, on the ground, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to take it off. Um, I'll just do something else there. So you never take the mulch off of that. No, I mean, uh, I mean, maybe there's some point. Uh, I'm sure it has happened, but right. I really not don't. Not generally. No. Yeah. What yeah. do you use for your mulch? I use uh, uh, round bales, um, mulch hay round bales, you know those big five foot yeah. sure. round bales. Um, this year I got round bales, previously I've used square bales. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I know the local farmers and um, they know I'm looking for mulch hay and there's stuff that got rained on, they never got brought in. It was really, you know, not fit for forage in the first place, and so that's what they brought it in. And they're like, hey, hey, <laughs> 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 I got a little, little trailer that I hook up to the truck, and off we go. And, um, yeah, yeah. But that doesn't lead to weeds later on, because you said that's bacterial, right? It's not fungal. Um, well, it's not compost exactly. Oh, that's true. It's hay, and there certainly are seeds in hay. Um, um, my, I've got a couple comments about that. One is that where I'm growing was a pasture hay field for 30 or 40 years, so there's <laughs> probably wheat seeds and hay seeds in that field already. So uh, it's a few more grass seeds among friends. Um, um, yeah, I, if you do a thick enough layer of mulch, you know, what seeds can contact the soil, have a hard time seeing sunlight, whatever seeds can see sunlight are not in contact with soil, so you really don't get much germination even though, I mean, successful establishment, even though you do get some germination of those weed seeds, A. And B, my understanding is that earthworms love seeds mm -hmm. and digest them. And if you've got a good earthworm population and they're, you know, regularly making their way through your soil, they're going to be having a dramatically negative impact on your um, seed bank. I mean, they're going to be draining out the seed bank in your soil fairly rapidly. So um, I do try to, you know, use earthworms as a, as a guidepost for how well my soil is doing. Um, I like to go out at night with a flashlight. Um, you know, see the earthworms go scurrying down, down yeah. their holes. Yeah. Um, I, I like to see an orgy, I like to see. Because it <laughs> oftentimes is an orgy. Going out there just <laughs> all over the place, going at it. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, it's a... <clears throat> anyway, that, that to me shows a good level of system function. Um, and like I said before, 40,000 pounds of earthworm castings per acre for free, evenly applied through the growing season, if you can create a reality where earthworms are flourishing. Um, and to me, that's a massive fertility benefit, right? I mean, if you had to buy that, if you were to, if you were to buy that as earthworm castings, if you were to buy it as compost, if you were to make this compost, you know, that is a ton of work and probably a lot of money. And this where you're getting, simply by creating an environment where nature is flourishing, you are doing, you know, you're getting a major system benefit um, with nominal effort. Um, and I find keeping the soil covered with mulch or, you know, dead cover crops is, is really, really key. Uh, it really, really helps that process occur. Bare soil, you don't find the levels of earthworms in soil that's been kept bare that you find in soil that's got some kind of cover on it. Um, <clears throat> all right, any other questions? Uh, potting soil, the next topic. Uh, bottom page four, potting soil. Um, this is one topic where I don't have as much of a specific set of suggestions as I'd like to. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is because I don't know enough. Um, the other one is because of the permutations of the already existing system. Um, so I made a comment this morning, I believe, about uh, sterile media. Um, this concept that um, that which you put your seeds into should have no life in it. Um, and actually the companies consider that to be something that they should be proud of in marketing. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that is enough to tell you that that's not probably a product you want to be using. 
Um, I'm not sure how many people do use STR Media. Um, it may be a good base if you're going to be mixing with compost. Um, but I generally historically have worked with a compost based pot and soil, which is basically compost plus different people use peat or perlite or vermiculite or something like that. So um, assuming that people are working with something like a compost based pot and soil, what I've got here on this slide are a set of ingredients that you could consider amending your pot and soil with. Um, and you need maybe a quarter pound of this, all these things mixed together per cubic foot. I'm not talking about a lot, right? Maybe, you know, um, <clears throat> What would that be? That would be uh, um, six, seven pounds per yard. Um, per cubic yard. Per cubic yard of potting soil. So not a lot. You don't need a lot of minerals to put in this. Um, my concept or the metaphor I like to use is, is uh, you know, um, if you understand the importance of early childhood development and nutrition when children are young, the question is, do you want to give your kids macaroni and cheese between birth and kindergarten? Or do you want to give them a balanced diet? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of potting soils are basically macaroni and cheese, right? Every day. NPK, soluble NPK, nothing much else in it. You shouldn't expect them to build strong bones. You shouldn't be surprised when they damp off. You shouldn't be surprised when they're older and they're susceptible to um, you know, mildews and blights and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have strong cell walls. Most of those potting soils you get do not have a sufficient calcium level which means that the plants don't build strong cell walls. They substitute potassium for calcium, and then they've got weak cell walls, and they're susceptible to fungal infestation. So um, I've got uh, kelp, alfalfa mill, zeolite, humates, omerylonite, lime, rock phosphate, you can read it yourself. Those are some things you could consider amending your potting soil with. I don't have a number for how much to put into each of those things, because I don't know what your potting soil is you're starting with. Different people are starting with different things. Um, I would consider something, some rough targets per parts per million as you would have in the, in the regular soil would be good to have. Um, but whether you're willing to get a compost test and test for all those elements and then do the back math on how many grams of this and how many grams of that, I would say it's easier to do the cooking right. strategy, which is just a bit, a little touch here, um, you know, maybe a quarter tablespoon there, a little dollop here, you know, half a cup here. Right. Um, you know, to, to feel. So anybody who's good at cooking knows that sense of feel that you get when you've just had enough salt. Or, you know, that was enough basil. I don't want to put any more basil in. I'm not sure why. I just sense it. If you can sense that, if you have that faculty, at least even somewhat developed, that's a really, really, really valuable faculty when you're farming. Um, that subtle sense, because that's when you're, you're able to tune into that, you know, intuitive, deeper subconscious knowledge that you, you can actually feel it. Um, and this is a this is an opportunity to develop that because um, it would be a real pain in the butt to do the math. Do you have any thoughts on the biochar since we did that, like to put that <clears throat> in the compost too? Like I think biochar fine. is very valuable in, in, in potting soil in small quantities. Right. Um, I was talking to a guy who's a really good farmer in um, he's in Pennsylvania, um, and uh, he's been on this track for decades and really has you know many acres doing a really good job producing. I mean, yields that would blow your mind um, of high quality crops. He's really a good farmer. Um, and his son, who was basically, you know, now he's my age, uh, was, is beginning to take over the farm, was, you know, playing around with potting soil recipes and was excited about biochar and put a little too much biochar in, I think it was. Um, and it got too hot and it fried some of the seedlings. I'm not sure what exactly it was. Biochar, worm castings. He was doing something in there. Um, I think Bioshire was part of it. Um, anyway, um, he was telling me what the percentages were that he had come to a Bioshire in his potting soil. It was a small amount, but he said just this little bit is, he said um, he was able to grow peppers from seed to six inches tall, ready for transplant in four weeks. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, four weeks. It's like, I got it, I got the recipe. I've been working on potting soil for 30 years. His biochar is very valuable. It's just a little bit, along with all the rest of the stuff, all the other goodies in there. Um, but we can do a lot with potting soil. That's something we're hoping to have available in the spring through the depot system is a really high quality potting soil for people because I think that's a place where a lot of farmers are struggling for a, a really high quality product. So did he share his full recipe? Or? Um, he didn't, and he would. Um, and I was, we were at um, somebody's funeral, so we just started catching up. <laughs> um, that wasn't not appropriate at the time. 
I yeah. just didn't, yeah, I was like, you know, going around in a circle and everybody's sharing their memories and we're talking shop in the corner, you know, <laughs> <laughs> get the notebook out and do a total download, you know, it was, it was anyways, um, but no, I do want to go down to his farm and, and, and walk around and, um, you know, pick his brain because he's got a lot of knowledge. Um, so, yes, I'm sorry I don't have Bajar on the list, that's a good point. Good. Should be, yeah. Um, so, I don't really have a lot to say about potting soil. Um, so I'll take any questions. I'm just going to move on. I'm not familiar with Montmorillonite. Montmorillonite oh, is a family true. of clays. If you heard of azomite, yeah. azomite is a Montmorillonite type. Um, um, there's um, there's a few different um, uh, products on the market that are Montmorillonite type clays. They're generally high energy. Um, generally have a good spectrum of trace elements in them. They're just a general overall. Um, Benefit, beneficial ingredient in a small quantity. Yeah. Do you plant the majority of your seeds like through the onions, just in open trays? So yes. Pastures? Yeah, I don't. I, I, I want to move more to blocks. Mm -hmm. I think I should do blocks, um, and I haven't gotten my act together. I don't. One of the shortcomings I have in my farm is I don't have a good cultivation house. Um, I've got a sunroom in the front of my house, which is gets too hot and gets too cold and doesn't get maintained um, moisture. Um, but I don't have a cultivation house, so I do a lot of big borrowing and stealing, bartering, um, taking people's extra seedlings. I know enough people would like, hey, uh, looking for some uh, kale, kind of big kale seedlings. Uh. <laughs> my mother, I oftentimes do a barter with my mother for minerals. Um, I give her minerals, she gives me seedlings, because she does a halfway decent job. Um, so, yeah, last couple of years she's grown my onions for me. But I do want to, I do want, I think, I think blocks makes a lot of sense. I think blocks is a really good strategy for a lot of a lot of crops. So I want to move, move in that direction. You just put them on a piece of wood, right, or plywood or something. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you, how do you, would you water that? You just on the top, or you soak them? Because the block. Um, I would apart? do like a mist, like a like a one of those shower head. Yeah. Okay. Nozzle. I don't know. I, I I haven't I haven't done seedlings as much as I should and could. Okay. Um, yeah, the blocks hold together. They hold you, really well. You use peat moss, and that kind of glues it together. Mm. And you just, yeah, water from the top. And they're, and they're basically, you know, you can stack them so they're basically in direct contact with each other. Oh, yeah. um, so it's not like a place where they can fall apart. It's just you can pick them up, and you can move them up. People know the block system, which basically is like a little thing, and, and you can and you can move them from a small block to the next size to the next size. You can take that seedling and just pop it into the next size. It's, it's like a, the next size block has a hole in the middle. That's the size of the previous size block, and you can just block it up. So Is there can, an advantage to starting with the bigger block? Because you said you didn't want the roots to reach the point where they. Um, the only disadvantage, the only, the logistical issue is if you're growing hundreds of plants or thousands of plants, you don't have enough space for four inch blocks, and that's too much money in potting soil. Okay. So you want to give the ones that need it to the most vigorous and most valuable that big block, but otherwise it's a uh, Space and money issue. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. If you're part of so. Um, tillage. I think I talked about tillage to a decent degree already. Um, I talked about the negative implications of tillage, the rationale behind tillage, the strategies for minimizing tillage, the concept of keeping your soil covered um, with something green, ideally, with something brown, um, if at all possible, and trying to minimize the amount of time that you are able to see your soil. Um, so, I don't know if I have much else to say about that. No one has well, maybe questions. our last question is uh, spading machines. Spaders, yes. Spaders, yeah, spaders, spading machines. Um, and my thoughts on them, um, your thoughts on them. basically. Uh, I've never used one myself. I think actually maybe like 15 years ago in California I used one once. But, um, um, yeah, they're supposed to be less destructive of the soil structure. Mm -hmm. um, they certainly go down fairly deep and pick the soil up, so I think there's some decent amount of destruction. Um, tillage, I mean, so if you're going to be tilling six inches deep or spading six inches deep, I think spading would be less destructive. But I'm tilling an inch and a half deep, and <coughs> spaders don't do inch and a half. Spaders are, you know, four to six inches or six to eight inches, and that's all they are. Um, 
So, and they're expensive. So I've never had one because they're too much money. You <laughs> get plenty of money, so no problem. <laughs> um, and uh, the soil I'm working with is, doesn't, isn't deep enough. Um, if I was to run one of those on my land, it would be broken. Um, <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> There's way too many rocks, uh, way too close to the surface. So, um, yeah, I think they're in general better, but I don't think they're the be all end all. Um, um, I don't know. Every every now and then to loosen things up, if it starts the soil starting to get tight, go for it. But yeah, it's a pretty vague answer. All right. So. Is that a question? As far as forming beds, yes. have you ever heard of any methods used without one of the bed formers um, that come attached to the tractors? And, I mean, otherwise, I think doing it by hand would be probably very, very good. What I've used most of my life was a tribal rototiller with a, um, a little V-shaped attachment that goes on behind it. And that thing is basically, it just looks like this, and it walks behind the tiller. It's attached to the back of the tiller. You don't have to have the, um, well, depending on how old or new your tiller is, you can turn the blades off. Um, but generally, if you get the tines going, that'll loosen up the soil and the um, hiller furrow, I think it's called, attachment, which is basically just a V, just basically takes you a pretty nice, pretty nice uh, pathway. So that's what I've almost always used. I just got this uh, bed maker in the last couple of years. Yeah. That's like a walk behind, not. A Troy built to walk behind a rototiller. Okay, so like a yeah. BCS. And much smaller and less expensive than a BCS. But it's yes. called a tread? No, I don't know. Troy, Troy built. Troy, oh, Troy. like Troy, New York. Um, is where they're from. Isn't one of you guys from Troy? Mm. What's that? I'm from Albany. Albany. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not Troy. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm from Montpelier. I am not from Barry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Look, yeah, no, um, anyway, Troy, Troy, New York is where the Troy Belt is from. Okay. It's, a, it's one of those old 30 side, 30, yeah, 30 other side of the river, exactly. Um, 30, 40 years old. My Troy Belt was uh, actually one year older than my wife. Um, we got it off at Craigslist for 250 bucks in 1978. Um, uh, you know, the engine blew eventually, and I got a new five horsepower engine for it. So. And not you know nothing big and expensive and high tech, mm -hmm. um, but definitely functional. Um, so great, thanks. <clears throat> um, there's some other ones out there that are pretty good, uh, but yeah. Anyways, that's what I use as a bed farmer. I'm one of those. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right. Um, so page five: complexing of compounds and evolution of pest and disease resistance. Um, this is. Um, my understanding of the basic biochemistry involved in um, pest and disease resistance. So I'll lay this all out here and do my best to explain it as I can. Um, for starters, the plant starts out making simple sugar, right? We talked about that with, with um, um, photosynthesis. And out of simple sugars, when you, basically when you uh, join a bunch of sugars together to build a long chain of stable compound, it's called a carbohydrate. Um, that is the you know, first level of complexing of compounds, basically, that goes on biochemically in plants. Um, through, after, the build, after carbohydrates are built, um, next thing that comes are called uh, proteins. Then you tie up, and you basically, from carbohydrates, you're able to build amino acids. And you tie the amino acids together into a stable long chain compound that's called a protein. Um, and then when you've got good levels of proteins, you're able to begin to build lipids, which are called the fat, which are the fats and the oils in the plant. And then finally, when you're, once you've built a good level of those fats and oils, they are the building blocks for then the secondary metabolites, the carotenoids, the terpenoids, the phenolics, um, those compounds which make a plant taste good and smell good to us. Um, so it's a, it's a process of starting off with simple sugar and ending up with flavor and aroma. It goes through building carbohydrates, building protein, building fats and oils. And um, what happens in a plant, and this is also what happens in animals, and I, it is, as I understand it, the foundation of you know, our physiological breakdown, whether you've got hormonal issues, um, you know, glandular issues, we have all these ways in which we are not functioning right, um, societally, and people are on various pharmaceuticals to attempt to balance out these imbalances. Um, my understanding is that it is 
simply deficiencies in the environment which are holding the plant back from being able to build carbohydrates out of sugar or from being able to build proteins out of amino acids. Um, so when the plant has access to what it needs from the environment, it's able to go through the process of building all these compounds. But when it doesn't, it has to stop at the level of complexity it was only able to go to. I'm not sure if that makes basic sense to people. Um, I'm losing my, my clarity as the day proceeds, but um, on the next slide correlates those compound levels with pest and disease um, uh, types. So uh, <clears throat> those things which are generally in the range uh, called soil-borne pathogens, um, you've got Fusarium, Verticillium, Alternaria, I've got it written down there, there's Pythium, there's, um, um, there's a couple other ones. Anybody's ever heard of Pythium, Verticillium, Alternaria? These are what are called soil-borne pathogens. They're fairly simple, um, and they can only digest simple sugars. They can't digest anything more complex than a simple sugar. So when your plant is building complex carbohydrates, complete carbohydrates, it becomes physiologically indigestible to those pathogens. You don't need to worry about removing Verticillium from your soil or removing Pythium from your soil. You just need to worry about raising a plant which is not digestible to pythium or verticillium. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't talk about digestion, so let me just do that first for a second. Um, I like to use the example of a bale of hay. Um, presumably, um, at one point in the past 150 years, there was a bale of hay in here, maybe even more than once. But imagine there's a bale of hay in here now, and imagine that a cow walked through the front door. Um, while the rest of us might have considered that bale of hay as a seat, the cow, presumably, would view that bale of hay as food. And to all of us, that's probably a fairly obvious statement. Uh, the question is, why is it food for the cow and not food for us? It's a fairly simple answer. They can digest it. Because she's got four stomachs. We've only got right. one. Right? She can digest cellulose and we can't. Just like the fungi can digest wood and the bacteria can't. So we, are under we understand this idea that some organisms can digest compounds that other organisms can't. So if you're okay with that conceptually, think about um, a Colorado potato beetle, larvae. Right? That is not a sophisticated organism. It does not have a liver. It does not have the enzymes in its gut to digest protein. So the next level of complexity of compounds is building proteins out of amino acids. When you have a plant that is able to build complete proteins out of amino acids, it becomes indigestible to the larval forms of insects. The larval forms of insects don't have livers, they can't digest protein. So when your plant is building protein in its leaf as part of its basic biochemical process, it's like hay to us. Right? If you gave your babies a bowl full of hay for breakfast, like, no good. they're going to starve. Right? They're going to be dead. You're not going to want to lay your eggs where all they have to eat is hay, right? If, you, if I can mix my metaphors. Um, and that actually, interestingly, is what the antenna on the insects are doing, is reading the frequency of the compounds in the plant leaf. And amino acids vibrate at one frequency, and protein vibrates at a different frequency. And the antenna of the Colorado potato beetle is an example is tuned to the frequency of amino acids in a potato leaf, because that's food for their babies. And that's how they find the potato plants, doesn't matter where you rotate them to, is because it's like a, it's like a radar, you know, it's like a big flashing neon light for them. They see potato leaf full of amino acids, <coughs> they come flying over and it's like, land here, land here, right? If you got a potato leaf full of protein, it's vibrating at a different frequency because protein is a different compound. And they're not tuned to that frequency, and they can't see it, and they fly right over. That's my understanding of the actual technical science of how this works. Kind of exciting. It is. I'm not sure if anybody else is excited about that. <laughs> I think that's totally cool. <laughs> <coughs> Next level of complexity of compounds is the um, lipids, the oils. I talked about that earlier today when I said that a shiny leaf um, is one is a connotes a plant that has high levels of fat and, and oils. So when you have shiny leaves on your plants, you should expect um, um, airborne uh, fungal resistance, the blights and mildews, powdery mildew, downy mildew, fire blight, late blight. Um, you can expect 
you know, categorical resistance to these pathogens when your plants are building high levels of lipids. Um, and the final f level of complexity of compounds is the secondary metabolites. I've got written down as phytolexins, but basically those things which make something smell good and taste good to us. Only when it smells good and tastes good to us does it have these compounds in it which make it indigestible to the adult forms of insects, the beetles. So, um, I call this the nature's report card. If you are experiencing um, um, beetle pressure, that's nature's bee. If you are experiencing um, airborne fungal pathogen pressure, blights or mildews, that's a C. If you have larval insect pressure, that's a D. And if you have alternary verisilium pythium, that's an F. And only when you have none of those or you have rodent pressure, animal pressure, are you getting an A. That is, that is the only time when you should be